This question gives us a formula for a function and asks us to describe it in several ways. First thing I would do for something like this is go to a graphing calculator. I'll go to this app desmos.com to get a sense of what the formula looks like as a picture. So here I have desmos.com. I'll type in the formula. So there's an absolute value symbol in the upper right of most keyboards. It's the same key as the backslash. Okay, so as we can see, there are several line segments that are part of this function. And so it can be described as a piecewise defined kind of function. That's our first task here, is to translate the graph into a piecewise defined list of several different intervals where it follows different formulas. All right, this is the graph in question. So there's two very important points where the slope of the graph changes and they are at 0, negative 2, as well as 2, comma, 8. We can subdivide the interval into three sections. And so one of the important changes occurs at x equals 0, and the other is at x equals 2. When we go to our piecewise defined layout here, we want it to follow a different formula when x is greater than or equal to 2, as it does when x is between 0 and 2, and it'll follow a different formula when x is less than 0. So this is the region where x is between 0 and 2. And we would say that like this. And then on the right, we have x being greater than 2. And on the left, x is less than 0. Those are the three intervals that are important. Now we want to give formulas for these line segments. So we're going to definitely want to find the slope of each of the segments. I can use these two points here in the calculation of the slope for the middle section formula for slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So I would use this as my y2 and this can be my y1. So let's do 8 minus negative 2. Then we can use 2 as the x2 and 0 can be the x1. So we'll have 2 minus 0 in the bottom. This is going to give us 10 over 2, which is a slope of 5. Now that we know the slope for that section, we also have to find its intercept because we want to write a formula in the form of y equals mx plus b for that section. So it's going to be y equals 5x plus something. The B here is going to be where the line touches the y-axis. So that's going to be the negative 2. So we'll have 5x plus a negative 2. That's going to be the formula that our function follows between an x of 0 and an x of 2. So plug that in here.
Next, we want to calculate the slope for the other segments. So I just have to pick another arbitrary point that we can use to calculate our slope of this section on the left. This point is negative 4, 10. And so when we're doing the slope, I'll do negative 2 minus 10. And then for our denominator, we'll use 0 minus negative 4. This is going to give us a slope of negative 3. And for this segment, the B is also going to be the same as it was for the middle segment here. <clears throat> so our B will be negative 2. We'll have negative 3x minus 2 then. For the segment on the right, I'll use a point 3 comma 11 for my slope calculation. So it's going to be 11 minus 8 over 3 minus 2, which is a slope of 3. However, for this one, we see that the segment doesn't actually touch the y-axis. But we have to find out where it would touch if it did hit the y-axis. I mean, if we were to extrapolate this and keep it going at the same angle that it was going at, where would it potentially hit the y-axis if it could? Uh, so, that location is going to be the B that we need for that segment. So I'm going to start off with just a Y equals MX plus B. I'll plug in the slope of that segment and leave the B unknown. At this point, I can use any coordinate that the segment touches. That could be the 2 comma 8 or the 3 comma 11 or any other point that's on that segment. So I'm going to I'm going to plug in 2 comma 8. All right, so that's an x of 2 and a y of 8. So we'll get 8 equals 3 times 2 plus b. And we would now solve for b. This is an algebra technique for finding the intercept. So subtract 6, and we find that b is 2, positive 2. All right, that means our formula then is going to be y equals 3x plus 2 for that segment. It's important that we use the right b so that if we were to plug in any particular x that's greater than 2, we want this formula to be able to predict where that, those points would be. And with the right intercept, it'll do that now. Like for example, if I was to test it and just plug in an x of 3, it's supposed to say 11, which this one does, so that formula works out. All right, our next task is to find the zeros of the function. These would be places where the function is equal to zero. So what we can do is look at our graph and see where does the function intersect the x-axis. These will be zeros. We'll want to follow the formula of the segment in question where it touches. So for this one here, I'll use the formula that's appropriate for that segment, which was this one. So anywhere to the left of 0, the graph follows negative 3x minus 2. But what we'll do 
is instead of writing y equals negative 3x minus 2, we'll replace that y with a 0. And now solve for x. So it looks like x is going to be negative 2 thirds. And that's going to be one of our zeros. That looks about right, because it's between negative 1 and 0. Now for the other 0, we want to follow the formula for the middle segment, which is going to be this one. So we'll write 0 equals 5x minus 2. And then solve. And it looks like x is 2 fifths. Next, we're asked to put those x intercepts into coordinate pair form. Our smaller value, that's kind of a misleading term, I think. A lot of times in math, when they say smaller, they mean more negative. I don't particularly like that term because negative two-thirds is actually a bigger size of number than two-fifths. Like negative two-thirds is negative 0.67 approximately and two-fifths would be positive 0 0.4. So as you can see, the 0 0.67 is a larger size of number, but it is negative. And so the program is most likely going to want negative two-thirds here. And we'll put it in coordinate pair form. So the y of any zero is going to be zero, because it's on the x-axis. Then we'll put in our 2 fifths comma 0. We can also see the y-intercept is 0, negative 2. So let's write that in. Now we're asked to find the domain and range of the graph. So one technique we have for this is we can plot several points on the graph and then imagine moving them toward an axis. So if we're looking for the domain, move all these points to the x-axis and we create a sort of flattening of the function and just shade in where those points would be found if they were on the axis. What we have then is a picture of the domain. We have to keep in mind that this function does continue going up and to the right as well as going up and to the left. And so that means our domain is going to continue as well in both directions. When we go to write the domain we would say that x can be any number between infinity and negative infinity. That's an algebraic way to write the domain, but this particular question wants the domain written in interval notation. So for that we would write negative infinity comma infinity, where this is the start of the interval and infinity is the end of it. There's other ways to understand the domain here, too. We could refer back to the original function and see how there's really no restriction on what x's can be plugged in here. A few things we look for is would a particular x that we input result in division by zero. 
or would it be taking a square root of a negative or perhaps the log of a number that's not positive. Those are three major things that we look for that restrict our domain. I don't see anything like that here. You can always take an absolute value of any real number. So there's really no restriction on the domain according to the formula. Also, when we wrote it in a piecewise way, every x is contained in this interval. So there's no restriction here. There's no missing x values. When we do the range, we want to do the same approach. Take those points and now imagine moving them to the y-axis. And then just shade in anywhere where the points would touch. So that's anywhere here. And we can go all the way down to negative 2. But what we see is that we don't have any graph where y is less than negative 2. So this is an important point where our range actually starts. So that's going to be the start of the range. And then the end of the range will be at the top. But it keeps going forever, and so the end of the range would be infinity, but infinity is not a discrete real number that we settle out on. It's just an idea that we're heading towards. And so we're going to say the range goes from negative 2 to infinity. We'd use parentheses with the infinity, but down here we see that negative 2 actually is part of the range. It's included. So any y's that are greater than or equal to are part of the range. And so for that reason, we're going to use a square bracket with the negative 2 because that indicates that negative 2 is included as a potential output value of this function. Next they ask us where does the graph increase and decrease and when may it be constant? So for that we might think about what it might be like to walk along this function as if it was a side view or profile view of Earth. So if this was a hill for example that you're walking on. We always want to think about ourselves moving to the right in the positive x direction and how does our elevation change when we do that. So if you go to the right this person would be going down in elevation. So that indicates a decreasing slope. Eventually the person will reach the very lowest point which is like a valley, but then as they continue to walk to the right, they're going to start to rise in elevation. So every step to the right results in an increase in y. So this is going to be a section where we have an increase in graph. When we're decreasing, we're to the left of the origin. So these are places where our x is less than zero. And then when we're increasing, that's everywhere to the right of the origin. So that's when x is greater than zero. To write these in interval notation, the increasing section will be zero comma infinity. And the decreasing section would be negative infinity comma zero. There's no place where our function is constant. To have a function that's constant, you have to have a horizontal line. We don't have that, so that, there's no interval for that. 
and the empty set is one way to say that it doesn't exist. Lastly, we're asked about relative mins and relative maxes and absolute mins and absolute maxes. So one thing that I see quite clearly is there's a clear valley here where this would be a relative min. It's the lowest point in its local area. We also see that the graph is decreasing on one side as it approaches the valley and then it's increasing on the other side. That's what you need for a relative min. You can't just have a graph go down and stop. That wouldn't be considered a relative min. But this one does come down and then go back up. So our relative min occurs at 0, negative 2. It is also an absolute min because it's the lowest point on the whole function. When it comes to a relative max though, we would have to have some kind of U or V shape that's an upside down U or an upside down V. We don't have that even though the graph rises here, it doesn't come back down. So there's no local max, we would just say it doesn't exist. So I'll put D and E for that. And for absolute max, even though this thing rises toward infinity, infinity is not a real discrete number. So we'd have to say that the absolute max doesn't exist as well.